Love staying informed? Subscribe now and get unlimited access to local news, weather, and sports for just 99 cents a month for your first three months at inform.news join. Read every story, listen to every podcast, and download the apps that keep you informed and on the go 24 hours a day. So head to inform.news slash join right now to subscribe. What are you waiting for? Get three months of local news for just 99 cents a month at inform.news slash join. Welcome to Plain Talk. Happy to be with you. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about. We're going to be talking to U.S. House candidate Tom Campbell coming up a little bit later in the show. Also, um, I wrote a, I wrote a column about uh, some messaging polling that the gubernatorial candidates have been doing. And lo and behold, today we got what I think is the first attack ad in that race. Uh, Kelly Armstrong coming out uh, with an ad about Tall Tale Tammy. Um, and we're, we're going to get into all that, oh, which by the way, the ad cites this podcast, uh, is one of its sources also, uh, artificial intelligence created content, which I have some thoughts about that because that site that they, uh, cited, um, tends to rip off content, uh, from myself included. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that ad and, and all the claims it's made and, uh, Tammy Miller's response coming up later in the show. But before we get to any of that, we're going to be talking about a, a more serious matter than the mud that politicians like to fling at one another. Um, North Dakota, I, I think we all know the famous Miranda, um, right? When, when somebody gets Miranda, is the, the Miranda statement that law enforcement reads. And part of that is, you know, you have a right to an attorney. Um, and this is something we all take for granted in North Dakota. I'm not sure how many North Dakotans understand the mechanics behind that. You know, how, how does that attorney show up? Like, if you can't afford one, one will be appointed to you by a court of law. Well, who is that person? How do they get paid? Uh, and what does their work look like? Well, um, that actually is work done by the North Dakota Commission on Legal Counsel for Indigents. We have the executive director of that organization, Travis Fink, with us. Now, Travis was recently testifying before an interim legislative committee. And at the committee, actually had lawmakers apologize for the level at which we are funding North Dakota's defense attorneys. And I thought that that was, first of all, it was interesting. Second of all, I'm glad this is getting attention. I feel like it's something I've been talking about for a while, that our defense attorneys in North Dakota are overworked and underpaid. And I wanted to have Travis on to talk a little bit about it. So, Travis, first of all, thank you for coming on. Thanks for your time. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on, Rob. It's um, it's tough work, um, the, the, the work that you do. Um, but it's important work. I mean, a lot of times when we think about protecting our our civil liberties, um, this is where the rubber meets the road on that. The criminal justice system, you know, the, the, the state's ability to incarcerate us, take away our liberty in some places that have the death penalty literally take away our lives. Now, that's not North Dakota per se, although in the federal system, we still have the death penalty, certainly. Um, you know, this is it is the most awesome power that our government wields. And the first line of defense against that is defense attorneys. You know, they wield it for excellent reasons. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to like hatch a conspiracy theory that this is a terrible thing. We want criminals brought to trial and we want them held accountable and brought to justice. Um, but on the other hand, there needs to be a check on that power. And that check is defense attorneys. But in a lot of ways, we don't fund them enough in North Dakota. So, so talk a little bit about that hearing that you were just at where I think it was, I think it was Fargo representative, Jim Casper, who apologized for where the funding was at. Talk to us a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, and again, thank you. And thank you to your listeners for at least taking some time to learn a little bit about the public defense system in North Dakota. Uh, essentially, what happened is, is I am statutorily required to provide an annual report to the legislature through legislative management every year regarding the operations of the commission. We typically file that in November or December following the fiscal year, which ends at the end of June. So I filed that report and in the off years, we have the opportunity to appear in front of the interim judiciary committee to present that report. And I presented that a couple of weeks ago, which was file, followed by some articles in the news media and, um, and now leading us to here. Essentially what that report ended up providing is 
a, a snapshot really of where we're at right now in the state of North Dakota. And the reality is, is uh, we've been pushing for parity since I've been in, in administration of public defense, and we just haven't gotten there. And we're starting to see the results of some of that now, as we've seen continued caseloads, we haven't seen funding increase at the same amount. So we've fallen behind prosecutors, we've fallen behind other employees in state government that hire attorneys. So we haven't been able to fill our open spots. At the time I presented the report, uh, when we're fully staffed, we have 41 full-time employees. At the time I presented that report, we had nine vacancies out of 41. So about 30% vacancy rate in our agency at one time. Six of those positions were attorney positions. Um, so when you look at the amount of turnover we're seeing and the vacancy rates we're seeing, it's becoming incredibly difficult to find someone, as you said, Rob, to have an, a, a defense attorney at every appearance when an individual has that right to an attorney. Travis, um, Chad Oban here. No offense, Rob, but you forgot to introduce me again. Oh, but uh, I did. You're, I did. You're okay. I'm, I'm so. Uh, I'm so sorry. I'm an idiot. Travis, can you talk a little bit about where your offices are located? Um, what are the ramifications of being understaffed? I mean, one of the things I think about is if you're understaffed, in full full uh, discrepancy, I share an office with your uh, Bismarck office, and I see how hard people are working and running over to the courthouse back and forth all the time. But I can see a scenario where when you're understaffed, maybe you're not giving your clients as much time as maybe is necessary. And then you could end up with stuff getting thrown out because you're not. So can you talk a little bit about the scope of your operation? And then also what are the concerns about the fact, you know, if you're down six attorneys, what does that mean? Cause you, I doubt you can just say no um, when people come to your door and they're legally, uh, you know, uh, they, they're legally can get your services. Can you just uh, elaborate on that a little bit. Sure. And thanks for that question, Chad. So we ha are what's called a hybrid model. So we have seven public defender offices across the state of North Dakota that provide services. We also contract with private attorneys to provide services in the state as well. So our seven offices are located in Grand Forks, Devil's Lake, Minot, Williston, Dickinson, Bismarck, and Fargo. And then we also have private attorneys that contract in those areas, but then also private attorneys cover the rest of the state. The problem is, is with the contract rate we pay as well, which we got an increase last legislative session, we're able to pay $80 an hour on our contract rate, whereas currently the federal panel attorneys are making $172 an hour. And in South Dakota, they pay their contract attorneys $115 an hour. So you can see it's awfully hard for us to recruit people in the state to take cases for us when they can be paid twice as much to take a case in federal court. But essentially what ends up happening is when we have a shortage, we end up having to try and find people to take cases, even if they're not in that location. So it ends up costing us more money because we pay people from Grand Forks to travel to Devil's Lake, for example. So every time they go over to meet with a client, we have to pay mileage to go over and meet with them and to go back, plus the time to go over and meet with them and to go back. So the concern always becomes is eventually if you don't have enough people, we can't meet the demand. So what ends up happening, and I said this in my report to the Interim Judiciary Committee, we have some attorneys who are at 140 to 150 percent of the caseload we'd like to see them at. The danger in that is obviously it doesn't matter if you're a brand new attorney or the most experienced attorney in the world, if you have too many cases, there's an increased likelihood of mistakes being made because of the volume. It's just, it's simple math. And unfortunately, you know, when criminal defense lawyers are overburdened and we make mistakes, innocent people go to jail. And we know in this country that occurs all the time. And 2022, the University of Michigan Exoneration Center noted there was 233 exonerations. And the average length of stay those people spent in custody prior to their exoneration was 9.6 years in prison. So when Rob mentions the great weight of the government coming in and taking away your freedom, sometimes that's even occurring when you didn't do anything wrong. And that's a problem. Um, I think it's important to note, too, and I, I like to remind people of this, you know, our country was founded on those 
rights insured to the individual against the government, against that great weight of the government. So, you know, the Sixth Amendment and the Bill of Rights is that constitutional protection for people to be assured of that right to counsel. And the concern is, is again, if we don't have the people to meet it, what some states have done, and we haven't had to do this yet, I've had to inform judges that we're dangerously close just to let them know we're thinking about this, is a prioritization system where not everyone will get counsel. We have to prioritize cases as to who we're going to apply counsel to. Would that would that open up a liability for the state? I mean, if we're if we're at a point where your office just can't. And I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about it. Like some some of these some of these courthouses are rural, right? I mean, it's North Dakota's got a lot of open roads. Um, you know, so just just logistically trying to to cover you know places in, in rural areas that, that maybe don't have an attorney that you can hire you know to do it or, or that's willing to do the work um and then so you have to send somebody there and they have to be in two courthouses that are 200 miles apart I, I mean i don't i don't know the logistics of it i could just i'm trying to imagine it's not fun but if we get to a point where you have to start prioritizing does that open the state up to liability where we could be sued for for not violating people's rights basically to have an attorney yeah, I, I don't think it's a question of if we can be sued. It's a question of when we would be sued if we had to do that. The reality is, is we see that's occurring in other places across the country. Wisconsin comes to mind where Wisconsin had a waiting list and people were sitting in jail for, you know, upwards of like 90 days without getting their attorney. And, you know, groups came in and, and they filed suit against the state. And it, it's interesting. And I think Representative Colleen pointed this out at the Interim Judiciary Committee. The reason the commission was founded back in 2004 and 2005 was our neighbor to the West, Montana, was going through one of those types of lawsuits. And the state hired the Spangenberg Group to really come in and look at what indigent defense should look like in North Dakota. And the commission was the result of that. Now, I think where we're at is we need to get the uh, appropriate amount of funding to to move us to where we need to be. Travis, you alluded in one of the articles I read to the increased caseload also is somewhat due to changes that the legislature has made in terms of who's eligible for your services. Can you talk a little bit about that juvenile justice change and, and what that has meant? And you know, obviously if the same amount of attorneys and more clients eligible, the math doesn't work at some point. So can you, can you talk about that change a little bit? Yeah, and, and let me preface it by saying I, I think it's important that we do provide counsel in those situations because, you know, oftentimes we think about juveniles and sometimes we don't think about the collateral consequences that those kids may have. So, you know, what we were finding is the concern that people would just go in and admit to things in juvenile court and think, well, it's going to come off my record when I turn 18, but then you find out you may not have access to federal student loans um, you may have other lifelong repercussions for something you did when you were a child. So when we redid that Juvenile Court Act, uh, the legislature, I think, correctly found that as a public policy, we want to make sure we're taking care of our kids in the state of North Dakota. And part of that is making sure they have legal representation when they're facing the great weight of the government, just like their adult counterparts. What we did is we did put in a, a fiscal note attached to that bill. And I testified to this yesterday at the Interim uh, Juvenile Justice Committee. What we saw is, you know, the amount we had requested was trimmed down. So, you know, we had said we think it's going to cost about this. And when I reported a year later, we were pretty close. We thought we'd see about a 50% increase in juvenile cases. I think it was about 48% is what we actually saw as far as the increase. But we didn't get the exact number that we had asked for in that fiscal note. It went through several conference committees and it was trimmed down. So part of it is, is there's some increased cost there, um, but I don't think that's really the driver in the amount of case numbers we're seeing. I think the increase in the number of cases we're seeing is somewhat due to turnover itself in that what happens when someone leaves us to go for a better paying job at a state's attorney's office or a court where we've lost several people to both of those positions because they pay more is we've already paid that person to handle that case. But when they leave, if that case isn't handled, I got to pay another person now to take that case as well. So that's the compounding cost of turnover that actually ends up costing us more than if we would just pay people what they're worth. 
So that's been our continual struggle in indigent defense. Is is part of the headwinds in all this a public perception? Because sometimes I hear from people that um, you know defense attorneys are slimy or they're just trying to get criminals off. Um, and, and in fact, even I, I had a column earlier this week in, in our gubernatorial race, you know, one of the candidates was poll testing messaging against Congressman Kelly Armstrong. Uh, Tammy Miller was poll testing messaging against Kelly Armstrong, you know, kind of calling uh, calling out his history. He worked as a defense attorney for a while and calling out his history. Oh, he defended somebody who was abusive to a spouse. He defended somebody uh, who was convicted of child molestation. And I, I don't want you to comment on the gubernatorial race, but it, to me that indicates that, I mean, obviously this is a political candidate who's, who thinks that they can get traction with attacks like that. And here you are trying to say, listen, you know, criminal defense work is is hard. I, so I, I guess I guess that's my question for you. Is, is that public perception, is that hard? Make it hard for you to recruit attorneys and make it hard for you to get funding? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that plays a part in it. And you know, we do our best to try and, I guess, delete the myth, if you will. I mean, just this week, I was up at the law school. March 18th was the anniversary of Gideon v. Wainwright, which was the Supreme Court opinion that finally recognized the right to an attorney is enjoyed in all the states. Now, North Dakota had it in its constitution, but the U.S. Supreme Court didn't really fully recognize it until March 18th of 1963. So I did a presentation at the law school on the anniversary of it, and it's just, it, it's comical to think that something that was guaranteed in the Sixth Amendment isn't officially recognized by the Supreme Court until 1963. And so why is that? And I think part of that, Rob, to answer your question, might be some of that perception, you know, and, and we we do struggle somewhat with that. I think there's a perception also that, you know, public defenders are, overworked because we're often underfunded and things like that so again that hurts recruitment as well and retention as well i mean we're all human beings if you can go across the street and make more money and work less hours who's not going to do that right um so it i i think that plays a part in it as to um, you know, the legislative things, I wouldn't be able to answer that. I guess if I knew why those things happen the way they do, I'd, I'd probably make more money and not be working as many hours as I do. So Travis, you alluded to why wouldn't somebody walk across the street and make more money? And I'm a big fan of public servants. I mean, I think that we demonize people and underpay them. So my question for you is, why haven't you walked across the street? Like, oh, what, I, what, I, what makes you want to do this job and the importance of this job? I, I think, you know, I, I think that's a really important thing for you to tell the listeners. Yeah, and I do appreciate that question. And, um, you know, call a spade a spade. I did leave at one point. I started as uh, I was in a small firm in Grand Forks when I first graduated law school and became barred. And we had a public defense contract. And when the office opened in Bismarck, I moved out to Bismarck because public defense is what I wanted to do. I did that for five, six years. And I did go to a firm to try and you know, make more money. And, and then I owned my own practice for a period of time. And I'll tell you, I made significantly more than I did as a public defender and significantly more than I do now as the executive director um, when I was in my private practice. But what I did is I realized to me, it was about, I went to law school to help people. And this is the one job where I have had that I've had the opportunity to make a difference in people's lives in that, you know, I've had, and, and some of my greatest successes have been people who, it sounds weird to say, but it, it's the public defender in me. Uh, some of my greatest successes have been people who have maybe ended up going to prison. So we didn't get a not guilty verdict, but, you know, by listening with them and spending time with them, when we have time to spend time with our clients, we're able to find out what was really going on in their life, maybe help them find the right sort of resources to get the treatment they need and help them turn their life around. And when they contact me years later, and I still get these contacts to this day where former clients will contact me and, you know, and thank me for listening to them and helping them turn their life around. You don't get that when you're writing a good contract or 
you know, some of those other things. So to me, that's one of the things we provide is that ability to really effectuate change in someone's lives. It's, I, I think most Americans are never going to be in the criminal justice system in that way, right? Most of us are going to experience this through law and order or a true crime podcast or something. And we don't spend a lot of time thinking, well, what would it be like to be standing there and, and, and even more so, and I, I, I mean, I, listen, most people who get convicted in the criminal justice system are guilty. I, I think that's, a, I think that's true. Um, there's too many that aren't guilty. There's too many that get exonerated because we find out because there's DNA evidence or whatever. They're the minority, but, but one's too many. Um, but I don't think most Americans put themselves in that. Like what would happen if I was accused of a crime I didn't commit? Who would help me? And we just assume that this person's going to show up. Um, and we don't think about, are, are we funding that adequately to protect our rights in that instance? I mean, I mean, this is such a, a no nonsense thing. And it's, it's not even, I, I understand people who make, you know, conservatives, North Dakota is a very conservative state, you know, maybe thinking, well, why, you know, we don't want to spend lots of money. Well, this is, we're spending money really on, on resisting the government, right? I mean, it's not anti-government. That's the wrong term for it. But this is a check on government power. Um, that is so, so important. And, and by the way, if I can recommend, um, Gideon's Army is a great documentary about the Supreme Court case that Travis was talking about um, and, and how it resulted in, in creating, you know, criminal defense and, and a, a, a purposeful, intentional criminal defense system in a lot of places in this country where it didn't previously exist, um, if I can recommend that. But Travis, I thank you so much for coming on and talking about this. I think it's a, a really important topic. And I, for the general member of the public, I mean, if they're thinking, gosh, I'd like to get involved you know, is there something they can do? I mean, is there is there a private foundation that supports any of this stuff? I mean, it, w w what can people do? Yeah, so in North Dakota, we don't have that. But I think what people can do is just continue to talk about it. I mean, people talking about it and having these conversations about the importance of what public defenders do on a daily basis and having those conversations with their elected representatives, too, about the importance of what we do. Uh, because, you know, we are a, a vital and important part to the system. And, you know, I always call it the criminal legal system. I'm, I, I've moved away from the term criminal justice until we actually start to see some parity between, I'm not sure that we're achieving justice at this point. So really, I think, you know, as we look at the criminal legal system, we need that parity. And what people can do is have that conversation about the importance of parity. You know, I, I think you're right, Rob. No one thinks about public defenders until they're in that situation or they till until they have a loved one in that situation. And then it's, oh, this is what's going on. And so I, I think it's important and it's great. And I really appreciate uh, you and your listeners and, and having us on to have this conversation. I, I was once upon a time. One of the reasons I'm so passionate about this. I was once upon a time. My father was a a. Uh, homicide investigator in the state of Alaska for the Alaska state troopers. And when he retired, went into, into work as a private investigator. And a lot of his work, because he had all that experience working on the law enforcement side, is he would come in and be an investigator for the defense. Uh, and my sister and I both worked for his business. Now, I, I don't want to over over as over uh, uh, state my involvement here. I was the copy boy. Um, and, and I was the guy who, who was helping my, my father, um, you know, figure out this newfangled internet thing at the time. Um, you know, so I helped a lot in those ways, but I mean, it was his, his thing, but I, I mean, I got to assist, you know, I got to be in the background and see, I remember at one point it was a federal case here in the state of North Dakota. Um, and it was an arson case that happened on, on one of the native American reservations. And, um, somebody had burned down somebody's, um, uh, trailer house, their home. And we had to go and we had to like find witnesses and all this stuff. The FBI had had, if I'm remembering right, had like three dozen agents work on this case at one point. Uh, the, the federal court awarded us a $1,500 budget to investigate, to, to provide the other. So when you're talking about parity, I mean, granted, that's the federal system. Um, I mean, that's kind of what we're up against is, you know, they get you know, the state has all of its awesome power and all of its personnel and resources, FBI agents and BIA agents and ATF agents who could go out and do all these things. And the defense gets $1,500. Um, that's what we were up against at the time. Now, maybe things have improved. That was a while ago now. But I mean, I, that's the world we live in. And that's a, that's a tough thing.
Rob, and I, I would just add that I thought Larry Clemine at the end of the article basically saying we've had this, this these big budget surpluses. Essentially, we should be embarrassed by this. I want to double down on what Travis said in terms of contacting legislators. There's no reason that state public defenders on an hourly rate get paid a third or a half as much as federal folks. And so if we really want this system to work, um, and we do, uh, I mean, we, we should want it to work, there needs to be more funding. I mean, I, I think that, you know, not, not just the public defender's office, but other places, we're piling more and more work will not increase the amount of funding to do that work. And what that leads is to burnout and people leaving the public service and going on to other places and make more money. Thank goodness for people like Travis who are willing to make a little less money to do this work. But I, I think people need to let the legislators know that the, the folks doing this work are important and we wanna make sure that we continue to have the best uh, possible state employees. So I would just, that would be my final thought for listeners is contact your legislators and tell them this is not acceptable. Yeah, because this really isn't a top of the ballot issue for a lot of voters. And and again, understandable. Most of us are never going to sit in a at that desk, at, at the defendant's desk table in front of a judge in a courtroom and have to go through this. Most of us are never going to be accused of a crime. But the thing is, a lot thousands and thousands of people are every year. And it could be your nephew. It could be your son or daughter. It could be you. You don't know. And when it does happen, wouldn't you like to know that if, if you can't afford to pay out of pocket for a defense attorney, there is a robust system to defend your rights? I, I would hope so. Um, Rob, I've got one final question, yeah. and that is, Travis, what is like? how much funding do you need? What kind of increase do you need? What are we talking about here? Because I can't imagine your agency is that big in terms of the, the grand scheme of the state budget. You're talking about millions. You're talking about tens of millions, uh, you know, ballpark. Yeah, I, and I appreciate that, Chad. I think we're closer to millions than we are. I mean, so the reality is, is we've started taking a look at, you know, what different counties pay their prosecuting attorneys and uh, what the Supreme Court pays their employees and just trying to figure out what it would take for us to get there. It, it's not tens and hundreds of millions of dollars. It's in the grand scheme of the budget. It's a fairly small amount. Um, we're also, you know, Rob had mentioned investigators. We were the last state run agency that has, you know, public defender offices run by a state to get investigators on staff. And last session, we asked for three investigators and we got one. So we were able to hire an investigator and we're starting to see, you know, reap some of the profits of that. And when I say we, I mean the state of North Dakota and the people who are facing the great weight of the government. So it, it's not a lot. Um, the contract amount is the most expensive piece. So we're trying to find that right number. And, and we continue to work with my governing board, my commission, to find what that right number is, um, recognizing that we need to be on par with some of our neighbors, you know, that are competing for the same talent pool. Tra Travis, and, and I, I absolutely think the legislature needs to fund more. I, I think they ought to meet what, what you're asking for. Are there some other ways, last question, are there some other ways maybe outside of the box, like like a bar requirement maybe that licensed attorneys take a certain number of of, of defense cases or or a, um, I, I don't know, like, like maybe can the state establish a private foundation to, to receive maybe some private I mean, people who are passionate about this? I mean, are those solutions that could work or help at least? Yeah, and the other states have done similar types of things. For example, like New Mexico actually removed their public defender system is no longer um, within the government. It still receives government funds, but they also have this separate ability to provide some of these things. There's different delivery models. So there are different things that can be done. We've also examined other possibilities for uh, yesterday. There was a presentation about the opportunity to uh, receive some federal funds to try and help offset. Again, we have such a small administrative staff that sometimes meeting some of those requirements for the accounting of the federal funds, we we don't have the time to do right now. Um, so we're investigating what things like that maybe might look like. So we are looking at all of those different options that are out there. Um, the one thing we don't want to do when you talk about requiring to take people to take cases is we want to make sure that people that are taking these cases number one 
want to be there and are doing their job correctly. So we're providing not only legal representation, but high quality and constitutionally effective legal representation. So we want to make sure that people want to be there. We just want to make sure we can pay them what they're worth to be there. Well, not, not every, and, every lawyer has a criminal defense skill set. You know, some, some lawyers do wills and, and things like that. That's their skill set. And, and they would be a fish out of water in a, in a criminal court. And, and that's no besmirchment on them. It's just different skill set. All right, Travis, we're going to let you go. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thanks, yeah, Travis. Thank, thank you both very much. I appreciate it. Hi, everybody. I'm Chad Cool, host of the Northland Outdoors podcast. Hey, here in the Northland, we love our time outside. And on the Northland Outdoors podcast, we're going to talk about all of it. Not just fishing, not just hunting, but mountain biking, camping, rock climbing, bird watching, you name it. We're going to have it on the Northland Outdoors podcast. New episodes every two weeks on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. So look for it and join us on the Northland Outdoors podcast. All right, coming out of our interview with uh, Travis Fink, he is the executive director for the North Dakota Commission on Legal Counsel for Indigents. Um, interesting, uh, interesting interview. Again, you know, I think like Chad and I said during the during the interview, it's it's vitally important. That's where the rubber meets the road as, as far as the criminal justice system concerned is when it comes to our rights. We talk all the time about how important our constitutional rights are. Well, if you want them defended, then maybe we should be funding public defenders better than we are. Um, anyway, we're going to switch gears here um, and talk a little bit about North Dakota's U.S. House race. It's a it's a four way race now uh, between um, former uh, state representative Rick Becker, uh, Public Service Commissioner Julie Fedorchek, uh, a gentleman by th um, the name of Alex B Balaz. I, I apologize if I'm not pronouncing his last name, um, but he's a, a gentleman from Kandu who is uh, has paid and is going to be seeking the endorsement at the NDGOP convention. And our guest, uh, former state senator Tom Campbell. Tom, how are you? Good morning, Rob. Doing great. Tell us how the campaign's going so far. Um, <clears throat> I think very, very well. I just finished up. Uh, uh, I'm doing a 244 city tour, every city with 100 people or more. And yesterday I had about a 14 hour day in Grand Forks and Emirato and Manville hit those two towns. And I was there. I uh, hit the North Dakota State Mill, which was phenomenal. I hadn't been there for a while. We do sell some wheat there every now and then. It's only about 40 miles from our farm, ironically. Uh, I've been there for 102 years. Um, it takes care of about 20% of the wheat grown in North Dakota. And it is a, it is state owned. Every single person listening, we all own a piece of that because it's state owned and it's been phenomenal. Um, Vance Taylor, the guy that has managed it, has been a phenomenal job forever. Uh, I think without him as a management, it wouldn't have grown and expanded. Um, they continue expanding and putting additions on and very profitable. The money that they make goes back to the state, of course, the state owned. <clears throat> so I, I just can't say enough good things about it. <clears throat> it. It takes care of a lot of a lot of our wheat and we haul wheat there and they make uh, flour, different types of flour. They do a little bit of durum processing and they ship it all over the world. Uh, they're loading rail cars there and trucks and they package it and bulk flour. And it was just really interesting to see to see that state. It's about 170 employees and it's, it's a huge, huge uh, a mill that that uh, handles I think uh, 140,000 bushels a day every day, which just blows my mind. <clears throat> That's a lot of wheat. Um, we we grow we don't even grow that. And we couldn't even provide half a day's production, and uh, so it just amazes me how all the behind scene things going, the the, the food safety, the quality, uh, the technicians, all the stuff they go through that you know we take for granted when we buy a five pound bag of flour in a grocery store. You just or, or anything you guide people just take it so for granted but all the behind scenes we spent a two and a half hour tour there with one of the main guys and <clears throat> really liked it and uh you know we hit uh, several other businesses and different things going on and <clears throat> far with it or in grand forks and uh so i hit the schools in manville there's k through eight schools there and emirato um interesting <clears throat> two different things one concept was the biggest concern of schools is the teacher pay and a teacher shortage of course which we all know of that's a huge instance but <clears throat> we've also heard that um, some schools are having to have meetings prior to school starting or the first half hour or 45 minutes being in essence a parent because a lot of the kids they feel aren't parented and they need to program them they need to feed them 
And uh, so that was, I, I heard that and I, I, I didn't really realize that, that there's some challenges out there that come to the school and they have to fix that. But before you can learn, you got to have a full stomach and the right mind is what one superintendent told me. So I, I'm just learning a lot of things on the trail. I love it. I'm a people person and uh, um, it's been fun. I'll slip in pancakes at a fireman's uh, breakfast Sunday morning in Great Bend, North Dakota. And it came back up for the bike show in West Fargo. There's 2,000 people there, Harley guys. And I, I own a Harley, too. I'm not a diehard Harley guy. But, so it's kind of fun to relate to those guys and uh, just to see the cross-section of interest and hobbies and businesses and <clears throat> occupations. It's just been a, a, a great eye-opener for me and <clears throat> hearing what they have to say. Uh, it, it boils down to, I think we talked about this before, but I always say I'm here to listen and what, what's on your mind. And, and the border, by far, is the number one issue. And I think that's probably fed by the media because, you know, Trump was down in Eagle Pass, Texas. And, and uh, I went there two days, about three weeks ago, to Eagle Pass, Texas. And I, and I know Trump's probably following me. He's probably listening to this right now because um, he was there <laughs> three weeks behind. And, and that's a joke, of course, but I find that ironic. I spent two days in Eagle Pass experiencing what's going on. You know, there's eight different entities that watch this from the, the police to the sheriff to the highway patrol. And when anybody sees anybody coming across, which we witnessed, they can't do anything with them. They got to call the Border Patrol. The Border Patrol puts them in a van and they take them away to a 60 mile retention center. And then nobody knows where they go. Of course, we, we kind of know where they're going. They're going to different sites from New York. And there are actually Je Sheriff Jesse Janner. I was at a I talked to him a couple hours or a couple weeks ago, and he said that they are in Fargo and North Dakota. They're they're here now. It's not like just because they're going to New York, but. So that's, you know, there's drugs and people are feeling, so we are affected by it. It's not, people can say, ah, it's, you know, Chicago and New York, but they are in North Dakota right now and they're causing issues with drugs and stuff. So it's a problem and people recognize that as the number one, number one problem. People are fed up with it. So I, I went down there firsthand, experienced that, which was, was great to see that. What you kind of hear in the media is kind of true. Eagle Pass, they built the uh, the Governor Abbott's container wall you probably heard of. You know, we were right there. It's right on a golf course, too, which blows my mind. It's an 18-year-old golf course right on a border with container all around. It's like, what? <laughs> this guy's golfing. And there's yes. guys with, you know, soldiers with with uh, machine guns monitoring this. I just thought, like, what? You know, only in America. But it was it was experience. It was a good experience to, to witness that. Hey, Tom, you, you've you made the decision not to go to the GOP convention. You put out a statement on that. Can you can you tell the listeners sort of why you made the decision to forego uh, the, the convention? And, and, and are you sending a message to the delegates of the GOP that their voices don't really matter uh, by making that decision? Yeah, no. Um, actually, I was planning on going up until last week. You know, when, when Julie Fedorchik, when she announced her bid that she was running for the House, her first statement was, Win or, lose, she, win or lose, she's going to the primary. And I, I found that kind of odd that you would first say that when you're announcing a win. And that made it look like that everything was irrelevant to her. And and then I got to visit a lot of people. A lot of legislators aren't going because they're kind of oosted out of their districts. Um, and then, you know, Tammy Miller's not going. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I'm a practical man. This is going to take away from my campaigning in this the Tom's Town Tour going to the people. I went to 35 district conventions. I put on about 6,000 miles. 95% of the people at that convention have has heard my stump speech. I went there 45 minutes before every one of them, visited with people, handed them out my cards. Julie went to one. She went to Mandan. So she needs to go to the convention because nobody has heard her. So I, I'm just, and it's kind of, you know, it's, it's not that I'm sending a message. I'm a strong, conservative Republican. I love the party, always have. But, you know, Kevin Kramer sent this trend, set this trend about what, you know, when he ran was that seven or eight years ago when he didn't go and when Brian Kalk won and then he defeated him in the primary. And then, of course, you know what Doug Burgum's results were. He took third place and went, everybody thought Wayne Stengem was going to win and then Doug beat him. So it's it's just the changing time, I think, if, you know, why go to something when majority, 100 percent of people that are going that is the real decision is going to be made at the primary. So I, I'm a practical, common sense guy that just says it just doesn't make sense to me. So not not to slight anybody, the delegates, I, I feel bad for them. But it's kind of like, why go when the decision can be made in the primary? I don't know if it's right or wrong, but that's just my opinion on it. You know, Tom, when you when you made that announcement, um you said a part of your, your statement was the notion that approximately 730 well-connected insiders 
the registration at the time of making my decision. Now, I, I do think it's significantly more than that. I think it's the last yeah. I heard, I think they were up to like 1300 um, registered. I don't know how many are going to be there. Um, but you said basically the notion that those people get to determine the House candidate has always rubbed me the wrong way because a farmer pulling a 14 hour shift to feed his family and build his business doesn't have time for two days of meetings and can't afford to take days off to attend the convention. You, you kind of seem to be saying there that the people at the convention are insiders and you're taking your message to straight to the, I guess, the larger voters. Is that a fair yeah. summation? And what I meant in, by insider, that's just a few of the, the leaders that kind of set the trend. Majority of the people there are, are good people that are going to vote normally. So I, I was maybe, I, I, I misled people on that. Uh, you know, 95% of the people there, I would not consider insiders. It would be some of the top leaders that, that have always, you know, try to control it and uh, want to make the decision from the few there and not the masses of the people that that's where I'm a people guy. I'm, I'm, I'm hitting these, you know, 244 cities. Uh, it's the people's house. And I want the people to decide. I've had several people that are offended. They go, wait a minute. Wh why would a few elect in at the convention, you know, override my decision to vote at the primary when, when I don't go? So it's very, very few. A lot of people, it's amazing, don't even understand how the process works. I've got one of my best, closest friends. It's a very successful business person. He asked me about three weeks ago. He said, explain, how does that work? He did not have any idea, <clears throat> and he should, but he doesn't. He, he doesn't. It's not that he doesn't care. He votes, but he goes, how does that work? He goes, they, they elect people. You know, he, he wanted me, and I explained it to him, and he didn't know. And, and I'd be willing to bet majority of the North Dakotans don't know it's not that they don't care but they don't know that oh there's a district con republican convention and a democratic convention and they decide <clears throat> that person and and you got to pay thirty five hundred dollars too which you know to just to go to the state convention as a candidate um plus among other things and it's just a lot of people aren't aware of that maybe it's their fault that, that they don't educate themselves but it's just a fact they don't have any clue what's going on it's their fault but in essence they don't and they'll vote at the primary and for somebody to be not on the primary ballot that was you know slighted by that isn't fair because you didn't let the people decide you let just a few people and and to me yeah maybe that's always the way it's done but i'm, I'm a common sense people person and it just rubs me the wrong way a little bit so that i'm just being honest with you and forward it's, it's not a people's decision this is a democracy yeah. It's been hey, like Tom, um, one of the, the things that uh, some of your opponents have uh, released in the, the last few weeks are uh, endorsements from legislators. Julie Fedorchak has the endorsement of 54 legislators, Rick Becker of tw 26 legislators. Obviously, you served two terms in the state Senate. Um, Three. Six three three terms in the state Senate. Do you have support from sitting legislators or folks that you served with in the legislature who have or, 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 or other you? other elected mayors or, or yeah. other elected yeah. officials? I haven't. Um, when I'm out visiting with the people, Julie's home on the phone calling. And um, I would I, I haven't called. I haven't asked specific people for endorsements. Um, those 50 or 48 people, whatever they are, majority of those are Western legislators that have been there a long time. They're part of the establishment, which I would only assume that she's going to get because there's a few people out East. I talked to some of them. Uh, one of them casually had told her many a while ago, and he didn't expect his name to be on it. And he said that that was back when I was running for the governor. And he said that you weren't running for the house then. So a lot of that stuff, even Two guys told me with Rick Becker's deal said the same thing. He, he just casually mentioned that several months before, and he says, I, I saw my name on it. So I think a lot of those endorsements, when you get in the bat, in the voting booth, sometimes it, it'd be interesting to see who what they say and what they do. And after they see me working hard like that, I know several people have been surprised uh, of, of my work ethic. You know, nobody loves well, love my <laughs> out love my uh, love for the state by working as hard as I do. And it's not really work because I love doing it, visiting with these people, going up the main street, going to hospitals and the schools. And I just love it. I've had some people watch me when I camp, you know, some of the people and they said they've, they've never saw anybody that is a, that goes out in a cafe and hits every table with my card and shakes their hand and, and asks them, what's on your mind? What can we do for you? I've only I've only been hit with one aggressive person. I won't tell you the city or who she was. I didn't know who she was, but she uh <laughs> it was funny <laughs> um 
she just I handed my card and I was, you know, and, and she says, what party are you? I said, Republican. And she, I, I won't refrain from the words, but she said some nasty words and stuck it back at me. And she says uh, she didn't care for Trump. She called him a blank blank. She called me a blank blank. All the Republicans blank blank. But only one person in thousands of people in a month and a half has been unwelcoming. So that's what's kind of cool. I've been welcomed everywhere. And, and I'm sure there's a lot of Democrats or moderates or different people that probably you know, are on the other side of the aisle that, that have welcomed me and they want to listen to me. So that's what's so cool about North Dakota. It's North Dakota nice. And I'm kind of pleasantly surprised. I, I thought I'd run into more opposition other than that one gal that were just super nice to me. I've had people sign my petition that are Democrats. And they said, just, just, just put your name on the ballot. I go, yep. And I said, no, you don't have to vote for me. And they said, gosh, they look at me and they shake my hand. They go, that, that's, a, that's a nice approach, they said. I wasn't aggressive and I wasn't frustrated with them. So that's what I'm running into. It's just, it's very pleasant to see this. And I'm, I'm kind of surprised, pleasantly surprised. Rick Becker released a poll and, and I, when I reported on it, I, I called it dubious because I've never heard of the, we talked about it on the podcast as well. Never heard of the polling outfit. Um, didn't replace, you know, um, uh, release a polling memo with it. Um, but it, it purports to show that among, um, respondents, you know, 26.4% saying that they choose him on the primary ballot, 15.5 choosing for 8.1 for you, 50% undecided. I can say I, I was told of another poll it's from somebody I trust, but again, I haven't seen a polling memo. I don't know, but, but they put the race at Rick Becker at 30%, Julie Fedorchek at 25%, you at 6%. Uh, do you feel, first of all, do you feel like you're in third place in this race? And second of all, have you, have you gotten any sort of pressure from anybody to, 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 to pull out? And I, I say that from the perspective of, I, I do, I hear a lot of concern from, uh, you know, I, I think there's a big overlap between people inclined to support Julie Fedorchek and people inclined to support you who would really not like to see Rick Becker be North Dakota's at-large congressman. Um, and, and a lot of them are saying, well, maybe, you know, they don't want somebody, they don't want you want either you or Julie to be a spoiler in the race. Have you had anybody telling you that, that you should pull out? Actually, yes. Julie's campaign called my campaign and threatened me that, that if I don't pull out of the race, that um, they will use the Minnesota residency issue and the Bill Gates issue. And they will they will uh, slander me with that, and uh, I found that you know disheartening that 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 she would threaten me. It's like you know why if you're you know concerned about me being a threat, you know why can't you win fair and square? And the Minnesota issue, which is a total joke, I never heard of that. Um, yeah, I have a lake home. I go there weekends in the summer, but I've always been a North Dakota resident. Driver's license, paid my tax here forever, live here forever. So that is just beyond ridiculous. Um, I think they saw that Doug Bergen was at that party, you know, the summer I had when he gave his introductory speech when he's running for the presidency. I don't know. It got a lot of, it got a lot of uh, publicity on social media, but I mean, there's thousands and thousands of people that have lake homes in Minnesota that live in North Dakota. So that's totally bizarre. I mean, people can go back, look at my tax returns and license and, and you know, anyway, my businesses are here. And and then the uh, the Bill Gates issue, you guys, have. there's a lot of people that I've asked and I, and I love the opportunity to reply. Because once I tell them the truth, what they know, they they look at me like, gosh, you you need to tell people that. And that's basically, um, we sold some land to his one of his uh, companies that he has interest in. And we have a long-term lease, lease it back. The farm is, nothing has changed. Um, we don't know him, never met him. We don't, he's he doesn't influence our decisions at all. Uh, we don't know him any better than you guys when you turn on your computer and a Microsoft button goes on because uh, he's very wealthy of course he's involved owns a lot of things it's hard for anybody to, to do anything each day so um and i my my concern is you know we started this farm gosh four over four uh, decades ago from scratch and um we've had the farm program and crop insurance and if if my opponent rick gets in he's gonna probably do everything in his power to make sure we don't have crop insurance and a farm program that would entail my future for the for the you know farming and he denies it now. He's changed his whole tune on that thing, as you probably know, because he knows that he, he wants the farmer's vote. So it's been frustrating. But so I don't want this campaign to get negative. It looks like the governor's campaign may get negative with some of the stuff going on with what Kelly's, you know, uh, defended different people. And and that's the last thing I want. 
I would hope it doesn't get negative. People don't like negative. People are kind of turned off by politics, and that just continues to frustrate them. They can't win fair and square, but but to threaten you, do you want somebody that threatens you? And you know, she's been three decades working for the government. She's a career politician in essence, um, regulating industries where I've been started everything from scratch. I hired thousands and fed millions of people, and uh, um, I'm I'm a Republican, where I want less regulation and less government, and she's been a regulator. So that's, let, that's let, kind of the point to answer your question. Let yeah. me let me ask you about that. I, I want to. Sorry, I want to drill down a little bit on that because you said that you know maybe the people don't want negative and threatening, uh, given the popularity of Donald Trump in this state, and and given that that you've endorsed him specifically. Maybe that is what people want. And, and and maybe the specific question is, you know, just the other day at a rally in Ohio, you know, Donald Trump called the January people arrested and convicted for crimes related to January 6th, uh, referred to them as hostages, called them unbelievably patriotic and saluted them. Um, do you agree with him on that? You know, <clears throat> Donald Trump is his worst enemy. I don't like his people skills. He's a bully. He's you know has done a lot of things immoral. He's, he had good policy and when he was president. I do agree with that, but yet not perfect. He's a lesser of two evils. <clears throat> I'd rather him than Biden, but it is, it's kind of unfortunate that we couldn't find somebody better in our country than those two people. But yeah, Trump's done. I, I do support him and he's been a good president and I think he'll do a better job than Biden. And 82 or 84% of the people in North Dakota support him. You saw the presidential caucus. <clears throat> I spoke at it in Grand Forks and I made the front page of the paper. And it was interesting that Nikki Haley, I think, got 24 out of eight. She got about a certain percentage. But, yeah, it's, it's amazing that, that he has such support <clears throat> in North Dakota. But I'm going to support what the people want to support, and they're supporting Trump, so I'll support Trump, too. Tom, um, you mentioned that you know <laughs> don't want to be negative, and then in the next breath you called uh, Julia a career politician. I assume you didn't mean that as a compliment. Uh, so I think sometimes <laughs> negative politics is in the eye of the beholder uh, yeah, so that's, that's more of a comment um, yeah that's not negative that's just stating out facts <clears throat> okay. that we're gone because she is she spent three decades working for the government that's not negative that's just a fact you know if, if you want that type of person vote for that if you want me vote for me so I, Tom, I would, uh, like, negative is making things up and slandering your family or something huh okay so as a somebody who ran for office three times uh, and what served three terms in the state Senate, which I think makes you a politician, career or otherwise. What would you say are your biggest accomplishments during your time in the state Senate? I think that that's a pretty good precursor of of how you're going to do in Congress in terms of of getting things done. What would you say is your biggest accomplishment? Is there a you bill know, I, you can point to? I, uh, I listened to my constituents. I was the person that came up with the first newsletter. I was on the ground shaking hands and seeing what was on their mind. I introduced several bills. Some of them weren't successful. Some of them were. Um, the uh, uh, welfare drug testing bill, which got very political, and I still stand behind that. I had somebody that was on, I think, Michael Bell's uh, radio show, and somebody called in. And they said, you wanted to see, you wanted to starve children? I go, absolutely. That's the farthest thing from the truth. I said, when you get a second or third generation involved with a family that has drugs, there's a strong indication that that those children will be in drugs i want to if in this the parents test drug fee cut off their welfare benefits so that their children won't become drug addicts as well there's all kinds of uh between um orphan homes and foster homes and stuff to take those people out and put them in a much safer environment than keeping them in a drug home so that was a big thing that i spent a lot of time in um you know introducing a bill for less bills to be i think i introduced a bill that said some legislators introduced 20, 30 bills, which is which is crazy. Um, uh, I, I introduced a bill to have less bills that they could only introduce like five or six. And that got defeated because typical most politicians like to just, you know, have a lot of bills introduced. So I wanted to bring less regulation and less government. Um, oh, I, it took care of a lot of individuals and in constituents. One particular gal, um, her sister called me, who I knew, and she said she was in my district, District 19 back then, Grafton, Laramore, Northwood area. And her sister had a deadbeat husband that hadn't paid her any, he hadn't written out a check for her for like a long, long time. And she was frustrated. He had moved to Colorado. Well, I knew some people in, in, uh, in the uh, department that took care of that. And within three weeks, she started getting her check because it just happened to one person that had been from Colorado, knew it. They contacted there. And they got on his case and he started paying it. So those are the things, the behind things, helping one individual at a time, 
that, that that I was good at, so that nobody knew, and it's it's not a bill in essence. It just helped a lot of individuals in listening to them in in Washington or in Bismarck. Tom, just to be clear, the the drug testing for did that pass or not pass? No, no, it did not pass. Very controversial and very close, but it did not pass. Tom, I I want to uh, thank you for your time. I appreciate you coming on, and uh, you're of course uh, touring. What you called it Tom's tour of North Dakota? Is that Tom's Town tour? You can Tom's see Town I, tour. I, I, it's alliterative. I, a, I like it. I put a dot on the map on my website. As a, it's kind of like uh, Waldo. Where's Waldo? Well, where's Tom? Yeah. <laughs> Tom, where can people where can people find where you're going? It's on my website, uh, TomCampbellFriendy.com. And uh, um, like I said, it's been fun. I was uh, flipping pancakes, and I'm a man of the people. It's been it's been a lot of fun. Well, one, so, one of the things I like about North Dakotans is they're still, or like about North Dakota politics is there's still an expectation here that people meet the candidates. Um, North Dakotans like that. Uh, so I I think that's I think it's a cool thing. Um, and uh, good luck. Thank you for coming on. Hey, thank you guys. It was fun Thanks. chatting with you. Anytime, give me a call. Hi there, my name is James Walner. I produce and host the podcast Dakota Spotlight, a true crime podcast that tackles historical and unsolved crimes in the upper Midwest. Follow along with me as we search for a missing girl, attempt to solve a 45-year-old murder, and much, much more. That's Dakota Spotlight Podcast anywhere you get your podcasts or at inform.com slash podcasts. All right, just finished up our second interview with uh, Tom Campbell. I, I did, I mean, listen, Tom's saying a lot of things that politicians say, like, I'm not a politician, I'm an outsider. Um, you know, Tom, Tom Campbell's, you know, had Doug Burgum over to his house for a fundraiser. All right, you're not an outsider. And you've been in office, for, and, and uh, this is not me picking on Tom. You know, um, Tammy Miller's doing the same thing. You're going to hear a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of people who are absolutely insiders who are absolutely. And by the way, everybody who puts their name on a ballot is a politician by definition. So, you know, I, I'm not picking on him, but one of the things he said is that, well, people don't really like negative take negativity or, or the mudslinging or whatever. I, I, yeah, they do. Um, that's the reason it's done. Um, and I don't know how, you know, we can watch Donald Trump's ascendancy to the top of Republican politics and still maintain that people don't like the negative stuff. They clearly do right now. Rob, in this moment in American politics, words, they want it. Mark my words before the end of this campaign, Tam Tom Campbell will be running negative ads on TV. Mark my words. Speaking of negative ads on TV. Um, we got I, what I think is our first negative one in the gubernatorial race, unless I missed one. Everything else has been kind of biographical type ads. Well, uh, biographical, just hugging Trump for 30 straight seconds. Well, that, but, yeah, yeah okay. biographical. Well, you know what I mean. I'm not yeah. really talking about the other candidate talking about look at how much yeah. I love Donald Trump um, or look at how much I love my guns or, or whatever. Um, that's uh, that's kind of what's been going on so far. Kelly Armstrong's out of the gate today with a a an ad and a website along with it. Um, and he's coined a name for his opponent, Lieutenant Governor Tammy Miller, is calling her Tall Tale Tammy. Um, and it's, A lot of alliteration on today's show. A lot of there? alliteration, which I appreciate. Uh, as a, I, I appreciate it. But anyway, the ad is uh, taking a... First of all, it's got kind of a Western theme, like shootout at the OK Corral type stuff, which pew, pew, pew. which makes me think that they're, they're poking a little fun at Miller... Miller's off repeated uh, story about defending her family's uh, store. When I guess it was a very rural store. She's from Brockett, North Dakota. So it's rural Ramsey County. And it was a store and apparently it was robbed a lot. And her family would defend it with shotguns. Kind of feels like he's taking a shot at that. Um, it's also, um, you know, accuses her, brings up her donation to Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar makes an issue of the fact that Klobuchar voted to impeach Donald Trump, um, you know, and, and some other things. Now, Miller has come out and disputed this. Uh, her statement from uh, from campaign spokesman Dawson Schefter is Tammy's conservative outsider message is resonating. So Congressman Armstrong is already going on the attack just a few weeks into the campaign. Representative Armstrong's ad features one bull and a whole lot of B.S., um, so I, I will say, first of all, I have something in common with Tommy, uh, Tammy Miller. 
we both contributed to Amy Klobuchar. <laughs> um, so, so that's good, finding some commonality there. I, you know, I think it's really interesting the fact that, that Kelly's camp decided to throw the first punch here. And I think, you know, they knew it was coming. I think that there's some PTSD around the Stengem Burgum race in 2016 that Kelly doesn't want to get caught on his heels like Wayne did and instead wants to be out and sort of defining her. You know, she's up to this point, she's defined herself as being somebody who grabbed a shotgun and loves Donald Trump, right? I mean, so it's not like they've been, they've defined much deeper than that. I but think, well, you know, to Kelly be wants fair, to she's talked about, punch. she's talked about being a business leader at Border State and some other stuff. Right, right, well. right. Okay. But I think his goal here is to, before she starts hammering him with negative stuff, to make people not trust her, somebody they don't know very well. The the Doug Burgum political operation, and, and these are the same people that he used for his gubernatorial campaign. Um, I mean, they're they're known for this. They've never run a, a campaign that I'm aware of that hasn't gone negative. Um, and so that was coming. And and also, I mean, we had the we had the messaging polls that I right. wrote about where we, you saw the questions where you know they're talking about Kelly Armstrong being a defense attorney defending. Someone who was accused of child molestation and everything. And by the way, I mean, that's why I kind of brought it up in the I mean, I I didn't want to get Travis Fink talking about, you know, he doesn't have any place in the gubernatorial race. But I wanted, I mean, that perception, you know, they're trying to play on that, that, that you know, defense attorneys just uh, defend um, criminals, uh, you know, or, or try to get, you know, terrible people off from crimes. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of that stuff going on. I, I will tell you, some of the stuff I didn't like about... Um, Kelly's ad is if you go to the website, like they link, they have the source. By the way, they source this this podcast uh, for for one of their one. And, have, and you what gone I, back, have you gone back and listened? And which one of us is is sourced? Are we both say poll tested? It just links. If, if you go to the website, it just links to our our podcast subscribe page. So it's not it's not a specific episode, but it was the comment was something along the lines of. Um, Oh, I'm trying to remember now. It was it was something we said. Oh, poll tested, but poll tested yeah. messaging, which which we talked about. But I don't even think we were just. I mean, we talked about Tammy Miller doing that, but I'm sure right. we talked about a lot of politicians doing that. That's not an. They all poll test their messages. Kelly Armstrong, right. I'm sure poll tested every one of these. In fact, we have the question that was in my previous call. We we know we know we did. Um, right. So one of the things I didn't like though is that they linked to a a website called BNN Breaking. And I actually know something about this website because this website has stolen content from me before. It's a uh, it's they use artificial intelligence and they have reporters with bylines. But I don't even know if these people it's based in Hong Kong. I don't even know if it's real. Uh, if, if those are real people, the the quote unquote reporters, if you go on there, they're publishing dozens of news stories a day, which I, I can tell you as somebody who publishes maybe two or three a day, sometimes um, dozens. There's no way. You have time. So what they do is they actually they scrape like an article written by somebody like me and then they use artificial intelligence to summarize it and rephrase it and then they publish it as, a, as their own work. Um, and I've seen this because it pops up like in my Google alerts and they cited this website, which has actually been banned from Twitter for promoting fake news. And, and this website apparently like the Twitter account it uses now was promoting like COVID-19 conspiracy theories before um, back, you know, before the site. Anyway, it's not it's not a good look for Armstrong to cite a source like that. Like, it's one thing to cite this podcast or something, and maybe it's a little out of context or something, but that's just full on. You're just citing artificial intelligence at this point. So I will tell you that I, I don't like <clears throat> you mentioned the history of the Burgum folks and the, the hard hitting ads, the negative ads and stuff. I mean, I. I like they would do the same thing. They oh, sure. probably have done the same thing. Uh, they I mean, probably have some in the hopper, although maybe maybe they're going to I suspect their strategy over the next week or so is going to play victim a little bit from this before they come swinging back. So don't you think one of the interesting things on how the, the Miller camp handles this is, is she going to be the messenger on the negative ads or is the Burgum super PAC thing? gonna make a reappearance uh dakota leadership pack or whatever and will burgum's 
PAC deliver the negative message? Yeah. Uh, and is he going to pour millions and millions of dollars into having her back? I thought it was interesting. I mean, a lot of times negative messages are delivered by some other group. I mean, this was paid for by Kelly. Uh, you know, I I kind of like that. He's owning it. He's not having somebody say, oh, this if you're, is if you're gonna yeah, manager. if you're gonna do it, own it, do it. Yeah, right. yeah. Do I, it. I I don't have a lot of patience for that. I I do appreciate that. Um, you know, one of the other things we should point out when when the Miller campaign fired back is is one of the things that Armstrong's ad hits Miller on is her promotion of a DEI program at border, border states. Now, Miller's campaign says that, you know, the the ad references a job posting from May 24th of 2022 hiring for the, the DEI position. Um, and they said that the. Miller had left border states at that point and had joined Governor Burgum's office in April of 2020. Now, the the thing is, if you looked at her LinkedIn, she was still chair of the board of border states right. through 2023. So, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't I don't know what to say about that. Um, so I, and I don't think that there was like this clear cutoff day in terms of border states. I think even when she was working for the state, like you said, she was still on the board. Um, and she has made it um, a central point of sort of her bio, as you referenced earlier. I mean, there's her ads are shot at border states. Um, you know, maybe I assume as a chairman of the board, or even as a CEO, she probably wasn't hiring this person or whatever. So maybe that's unfair. But I mean, it, it's politics, right? I mean, um, I think I think the thing in this ad that's probably going to land with the biggest thud. I think what what might. In my mind, and understanding that neither you or I are the target audience for this, right? <laughs> um, but in my mind, if I'm if I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of of the average voter who's eating dinner or something, and, and this ad comes on, I'm I'm wondering if the donation, like if I'm a Republican primary donor, a Republican primary voter, I'm wondering if the donation to Amy Klobuchar isn't the thing because it's just it's undeniable, it's there, and it's easy to understand, right? Right. Having a DEI policy at a business you used to work for. Um, I mean, I assume there's some people who are Googling what DEI um, policy. Well, I, well, there's I mean, if, if you're if you're on if you're watching Fox News or or, okay, or fair, you know, fair, 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 yeah. they, they know what DEI is. That's that's been yeah. a big issue on the right for a while. And 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 I must say, I, I mean, not I'm not even necessarily dismissing it. I think I think we have we we have gone overboard in some of those areas. Now, do I believe that every company that, you know, does diversity outreach is is woke or doing terrible things? No, uh, I think a lot of them are well private business. If they want to have a DEI policy, have a DEI policy. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah, although although uh, she's going to tout her business record in, in the private sector as qualification for running for public office. It's in it's in it's fair play. Sure. Uh, uh, and what were, I can't remember. So they uh, in the polling that Miller was doing on Kelly, they hit him for donating to Susan Collins, who ended up being Doug Collins. But right. who's, well, the, the, other, Mitt who's the other person? Oh, Mitt Romney. Right. Yeah. So it's going to be and hard the funny for thing them is to Miller, go after him. Miller donated to Mitt Romney as well. Like it would, they both, both Miller and Armstrong donated to Mitt Romney in 2012. And why wouldn't they? They're both Republicans. He was the Republican nominee that year for president. Um, what this reminds me of, and I, I, you know, when when Aaron, my wife, was running for election in 2018, she got hit uh, by a mail piece from the North Dakota GOP for supporting a bill championed by Doug Burgum. And that always chapped me because it's like she's supporting your guy. You don't get to hit her now for that. So why would you hit him for supporting your guy? Yeah. Just like you supported your guy. It's, 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 it's I, I mean, it's it's part of the it, in this era, you know, really starting since 2016. It's so confusing in Republican politics right now because it's like, you know, right now, I mean, supporting a past Republican presidential candidate is now seen as a hit. Uh, you know, and, and, and the, the Susan Collin thing, I mean, that was the, that was the, their campaign messed up because they, they suggested in their poll question that Kelly Armstrong had donated to Susan Collins, who is a, I would say a very moderate Republican, uh, from, from the state of Maine. Uh, and he didn't donate to her. He donated to Doug Collins, who is a far more conservative candidate, uh, unsuccessful candidate for the United States Senate in the state of Georgia. So, um, that's kind of interesting. Did Doug Collins run in the primary? I mean, I don't even remember this name. Yeah, Doug Collins ran in the primary and lost. 
Okay. Um, and it was one of those. Yeah. I, and I'd have to go back and look, but it was a 2020 cycle. Um, okay. Let's just say he was, he's not a, uh, I, in fact, I think, I don't know. Was he endorsed by Trump or maybe he wasn't? I, I don't remember now. Let's but that's just, the race where they ended up with Loeffler and Purdue, right? As yeah. their two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Because uh, I think he took he took third. He was a member of Congress at the time, a member of excuse me, a member of the House of Representatives at the time. Um, so if you and I don't know who this person is, I'm not sure it's going to be an effective. Well, hit. but, I, I but people they weren't probably, even they, weren't, they, they, they weren't intending to talk about him. If 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 they had known it wasn't Susan Collins, they may not have. Uh, you know, but that's also probably why they were testing it. Is how many people even know who Susan Collins is? That's why they right. test these messages. And and to be clear, all this stuff we're talking about. Miller has tested these as questions. She has not put these in ads. I want to be clear. Right. And and the other thing is we don't know that it was a Miller poll, right? I mean, looking at the stuff that you uh, posted online, we're assuming it's a Miller it's poll. A, it's it could a Miller. be a super PAC. It I could can, be an independent. I, I, I talked a little bit this morning, you know, when I was I was talking about the the campaign ad, we talked a little bit about that polling. It was their polling. Oh, okay. uh, so I, I can I can confirm a hundred percent it was their polling. Um and, so, and, I mean, and what's, and the, what's the, 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 the no, Armstrong, what's the, the strong, response now? What's does, that? Does Tammy just, does Tammy just come out just right back at him? I, think I mean, so. are we, are we having three months of this? Well, I think, I think for a little while, I mean, you can't, you can't come out and, and complain that, that, I mean, cause let's, let's look at the press release again, right? Um, they say uh, Tammy's conservative outsider message is resonating, so Congressman Armstrong is already going on the attack just a few weeks into the campaign. This is exactly how career politicians behave when they're backed into a corner. North Dakota sent Kylie Armstrong to Congress to bring North Dakota values to Washington, D.C. and said Congressman Armstrong is bringing back swamp-style negative and false campaign into North Dakota. So if you're going to say that, <laughs> I don't think you can immediately, like tomorrow— Run, run another, run a, run a similar ad, another attack ad. I but think, I, I think they probably probably have to let that breathe a little bit, and then start with the attack ads. I, I think you should do a reel of all the ads that Burgum or Burgum Pack has done over the years of attack style DC swamp uh, ads. The uh, good old I, boys club, you know, <laughs> and and then and then Doug Burgum spent eight years couldn't figure out why he didn't have a good relationship with the legislature. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know. It, it's that, I mean, we've been talking about this since both of them got in, it's going to get ugly, got ugly yeah. a little quicker than I would have ever guessed. Well, yeah. I mean, the volume on this is going to be turned up to 11. Um, this is, you know, and, and I, I don't think it's unfair to me. I mean, there's always a lot of finger pointing who threw the first rock or whatever. And, and yes, Kelly Armstrong threw the first rock in this campaign, but, but, we got to remember the context here. This is a Doug Burgum operation. Everybody remembers 2016. Everybody remembers the flyers and the legislative races and everything. This is Doug Burgum and his political team. This is their MO. This is what they do. So, you know, I, I think it's, is, is Armstrong, Arm, and I'm not defending everything he said in the ad. I have problems with what he said in the ad, but is Armstrong being preemptive here, knowing what's coming? Yeah. Uh, you know, I think so. And and I think it's unfortunate this is this is what it's become from. I, I'm not looking forward to a race with two people throwing pies at one another about who is insufficiently loyal to Donald Trump. I, I think that does not tell me how these two people are going to govern the state of North Dakota. I, I would really like to hear about, for instance, what would you do about funding defense attorneys in our state? What would you do about flood control? What would you do about crop? I mean, what about all these other issues Rob, we should host a debate so they can talk about some of these things. We are working on that. Uh, Kelly Armstrong's campaign has sent me a slate of dates. Uh, I asked both. I should say I asked both campaigns for a slate of dates. Armstrong was the first one to get back to me. They've given me a slate of dates. Uh, the Miller campaign, I actually asked them again this morning. They said they're still working on it. They have obviously they're working. There's TV debates as well. Um, right. So they're they said they're working on it, and, and we have time. I mean, I'm, I'm not being yeah, critical. for sure we have time, but I think that's where we can have a little bit better um, conversation uh, about those issues because we're not going to get it on TV. No, uh, we're not going to get it in TV commercials. Well, that's, that's what and, I, said. I, you know, again, not justifying Kelly's ad, but talking about the strategy behind going negative or contrast this early. I think, again, going back to 2016, you'd rather be the first one to punch than to be responding to their negative. I mean, like you can't spend 
like Tammy can't spend time now running ads saying, uh, uh-uh, uh, we didn't do this. We didn't do this. Right. I mean, that, that would be a waste of resources. So she, he's going to get these hits out then she's going to respond afterwards. I think it's the right strategic move for him. Um, again, not justifying and knowing everything. Yeah, but putting a, putting a, putting a pin in our ethics and morality for a moment. Um, Yes, I, I think you're right. Because part of the problem that Miller has had is her name recognition is is I'm, I'm assuming still has to be not not great for someone who a lot better today than it was when she got in. A lot better yeah. today than it was when she got in. But that was still something I think she needed to improve. You know, Armstrong's going to interrupt that and is going to as she's trying to define herself. Now here comes Armstrong defining her, and now she's on the defensive. You know, again, I don't like the way the game's been played, but we're also we're also obligated to talk about the game as it is and not how we wish it to be. This is how it's played. And, you know, probably Armstrong coming out like this was a, was a strong move. I'm not sure that referencing an AI article and I suspect the Miller campaign is probably going to make an issue out of that. That's not going to look very good on him. And if they do have the dates messed up on this DEI thing, you know, that doesn't look good, but who knows? I mean, by the time we get to the next ad, you know, how much of this stuff is, is just going to well, get. And that's just it, Rob. How many people care that it's sourced from an AI thing? Or is it the three th- or, you know, 3,000 <laughs> gross rating points that they're going to see on TV over the next two weeks, right? right? I mean, it's yeah, they're going to they're gonna reach. I mean, as, as much as I, I as, as influential as I think my columns are, and I don't know that there's probably many people who write or talk about North Dakota politics who has a larger audience than I do uh, or, or that we do t- with this podcast as well. Um, you know, we're, we're dwarfed by, you know, the, the average public that's not tuning into this podcast or tuning into my columns, but is going to see these ads playing during wheel of fortune or something. Right. And, and I, you know, I don't know. I mean, maybe people can leave it in the comments, but I don't know how many swing voters we have listening to us either. Right? I mean, it's usually people who are pretty connected, uh, who are listening to the podcast, but, Maybe I'll be surprised that people are concerned about AI uh, being the, you know, but people have been putting goofy sort of um, uh, ways to justify a hit in ads as long as I've been involved, you know, yeah. finding some obscure um, newsletter and, you know, saying, oh, it was from this magazine or newsletter or whatever. And also, it's also taking stuff. I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of ads. Uh, I, I mean, I remember, I mean, Democrats have like cited my columns, you know, in the past where I've, you know, I've written tough things about Republicans. And and sometimes like you see the way they're using your words and you're like, Rob, I remember at one point in my early career working in politics, there was a Democrat who bought a weekly newspaper in order to periodically have headlines that then could be used in ads. Yeah. That doesn't that doesn't surprise me. Um, I, it, which they kind of call that like astroturfing, right? Where you're just you're just sort of creating your own, you know, trying to create your own um, self licking ice cream cone. Maybe that's the other right. metaphor for it. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. But they do a lot of crazy stuff with these ads. Um, uh, you know, honestly, if I were uh, if I and this is this is completely nobody's going to do this, but I wish voted just don't watch the ads. You know, I mean, I'm going to that's not going to happen and I'm still going to write about him. I mean, it says the guy who just posted the ad um, online in the news column, um, you know, but they don't don't maybe maybe the better way. Don't make your decisions based on these ads. You know, try to pay attention to maybe to the interviews, pay attention to the debates, pay attention to what the candidates say on the campaign. If you meet them in person, what they say there, you know, that that counts for a lot more than what's in these these ads. Well, Rob, I think the other thing that's interesting here is like it is such a small number of voters in the grand scheme of things, you know, 115, 130, 150,000 people. Uh, That's like the state Senate district size in a lot of states. So the other thing that I think is complicated for these candidates is how do you make sure you're serving your ads to the right people, right? I mean, just go. And so I think streaming services, digital, all these different new ways to get ads to people is really going to be interesting because just broadcasting statewide, the vast majority of North Dakotans aren't voting in this primary. You know, it's not a general election. Um, And so I think it's going to be interesting how they go about targeted it is. And mailboxes are going to get inundated. Loaded up. Inundated. All right. Well, we'll 
put a pin in it there. Um, it's going to be interesting to see. And um, uh, maybe by the time Friday, we'll have another attack ad to talk about for Friday's podcast. Nice. Is that, so? That's what we should do. This could just be the a report on attack ads between now and primary day. Yeah, yeah. And I just noticed I was going to promote a guest for Friday, and it looks like I haven't booked one. So... Uh, I need to get on that during uh, when I get off the air here. So anyway, uh, thanks for listening as always, and we'll talk again. Did you know Forum Communications Company has a robust podcast library? At inform.com forward slash podcasts, we have everything from politics, sports, true crime, outdoor adventure, and more. Visit inform.com forward slash podcasts and explore them all today.